Hi everybody, I'm Luke Hector from The Broken Meeple. If you like what you see, remember, if I'm up the video, consider subscribing to the channel or the Patreon, but most of all, get your comments down below about any of the games that I'm talking about on this batch of the Top 100. Before I get started, just a quick shout out to a site called Rent, Shuffle and Roll. They are based in the UK and they are a new setup business that allow you to rent board games. Perhaps there's some games on the shelf that you've always wanted to play, but you can't get hold of it, you can't find it anywhere, but oh, there's on this site. Well, you can now rent them ahead of time. You pay a subscription each month and they will basically ship the games out to you. You borrow them for that point, you can play them as many times as you like, and then you ship them back, preferably in the same condition you got it. I mean, come on, what more do you want? But if you look in the description below, you will see a code that they've given me that gets you 50% off your first month. So by all means, use the code and try it as a trial if need be. But hopefully you'll be surprised and it might even save you a bit of money over time getting games to the table rather than trying to pay the outward full retail price for it. So give it a shot, see what you think. You have my curiosity. So this is it, the uh, the penultimate part of the top one, well, the penultimate part of this half of the top 100, however it goes. Yes, this is the last 10 in this bottom half of the top 100, which does not mean that this is the end of all the garbage games, okay? These are all fantastic games, at least in my humble opinion. I know some of you have disagreed with a few choices here. <laughs> But yep, we're going to soon get on to the creme de la creme of games. These are the 10 that just sadly didn't quite meet that top 50 cut. There's only one new game here, but for the most part, there's just a few movers and shakers like before. But I'll bet you'll be very, very, very surprised at what the new game is. And I'm going to have to justify it big time. But uh, we'll find out more on that later. So let's get on with it. Get on with it. My number 60 has risen five places, which is kind of odd because it's not really changed that much, but I mean five places at this point is kind of fairly stable really. This is a deduction game which very much surprised me. Didn't know much about it at first and to be honest a lot of people still don't know much about this game because it's kind of unheard of and they've really not done a good job, it has to be said, on the publisher front of actually getting it out into the real world. But this is a solid space game called The Search for Planet X. I'll just bet that if we follow those planets we'll find Planet X. This is kind of one of those like logic diagram uh, types of puzzles where you're trying to find the new Planet X and it's somewhere in the galaxy you just gotta go find it somewhere. Well the idea is is that with the help of an app you essentially ask these questions about which sector these certain elements can be asteroids and gas giants and meet and planets that kind of thing but each of those items has or icons sorry has a specific logic rule like the asteroids have to be in a particular group but there's a you know there's a point where it stops and starts the planets have to be not next to each other you know it's it's stuff like that and as you answer clues via the app as to scanning several sectors or saying is there an asteroid in this sector that kind of thing you eventually start making theories and working out exactly where based on the scenario that planet x has to be but of course you're racing against the other players that are doing it i really like the puzzle in this it's just a good simple game with a nice clever puzzle to it and the app really helps to give it that little bit of a kind of techie side of things not to mention regulate the game now it's annoying <laughs> that you have to go online to get us to get the solo rules. I mean seriously they could not have put them with the game that would have been a lot easier but there is a solo bot that you can play against and honestly that's kind of my preferred way to play it really because as much as you can race other players it's mostly a multiplayer solitaire game really so I tend to play it against the bot solo maybe three players max if I'm teaching the game to other people but yeah it's just a cool deduction game that Foxtrot and Renegade have really just not said anything about. I don't know why you know the Something about their marketing just isn't really selling this one, but honestly, give it a try if you're into deduction games, you might be pleasantly surprised. My number 59 is quite a drop actually, which is gonna, uh, uh, I don't think Luke Laurie's gonna be happy about this one. It's dropped 27 places, and I think that's just mainly because it hasn't hit the table in a while. And it's not because I dislike the game, it just hasn't hit the table in a while and I guess that's just why it's come down the top 100 of it. But this is my favourite of a fairly famous trilogy in Euro games called the Manhattan Project. You've got the Manhattan Project original which is fine, you've got the 2 minutes to midnight which I thought was a bit lacklustre, too complicated and too long. Energy Empire though, which is Luke Laurie's uh, baby in this one, is definitely the best of the trilogy. But still, it's in my top 100 man, that's still good enough. Come on, it's a great Euro game. You're essentially running a nation, a nation's 
power plant network. And the idea is, is that it's worker placement, but done in the Manhattan Project style where you put the worker out, you get the action, but then it's up to you to decide when you're going to take all your workers back. So it's a very dynamic set of worker placement. <clears throat> but on top of that, you're building little buildings and you're getting special effects and resources from them. I mean, very traditional worker placement. But the tricks here is that when you generate power, depending on which power plants you've got, you've got these very cool custom dice to roll, which generate power that you can use in your buildings and on your various cards in order to generate the resources you want. But depending on which power you get, you have the side effect of potentially polluting your area. It's all right saying, well, I'm going to go entirely hydro and solar power. Well, great. They don't generate a lot of power for your buildings, though, but at least your atmosphere will be clean. But if you decide to say, you know what, I want full nuclear power. I want nuclear everything. Give me all the big yellow dice. Twenty-one gigawatts! Yeah, that's great and all. You've got all the power in the world. But it's also completely destroying your air, land, and sea. And of course, that's going to lose you victory points at the end of the day. So you've got to try and juggle the idea of getting the resources with getting the power plants with also cleaning up the environment. It's teaching a pretty good message either way but it's kind of set in that sort of Cold War-esque time period in terms of the aesthetics. There's even a Cold War expansion which is in the game that I've still to this day actually yet to actually use but as I say maybe I should get it to the table and try it out at some point. It's a really solid elegant, oh, I hate that use that word elegant, but it's a very smooth Euro worker placement and it has one of the best rule books I've ever come across for teaching a midway Euro game. Once you've gone through the rule book you'll know pretty much what it is you're doing and I had no problems at all. It's just very clever, a little bit different, and the theme comes out very strong. We're making references to everything from like, you know, horrible, you know, Soylent Green is people to Jane Bond villain polluting the, polluting the sea. You know, there's all sorts of things you can come up with for this. But yeah, I find it great fun. It's just not being played in a while, hence the drop, but uh, we'll get it to the table at some point. Don't worry, Luke, I promise. My number 58 has also risen five places, so much like the first game on here. It almost, I thought, was going to be a bit higher, but then I had to do a little bit of tweaking to the list, and yeah, spoiler alert, there are occasions where I've gone through the list and played a few games lately and it's like, mm, maybe that should go up and maybe that should go down, but obviously not for anything that you've seen already. I mean, everything that's published is the dirt fact. This one I had to tweak down a little bit, and that is one of my, thought well, is one of my favourite campaign games, but it is a a slightly messy campaign game, and that is Tainted Grail, a fall of Avalon. I love the setting this is. Gritty Arthurian legends, dark, gritty, you know, everything's gone to pot, several campaigns, a cool card combat system that I quite like, you know, it can make the game a bit long, but I still quite like it. But it's got great writing, a wonderful story, it's even got an app that you can use as a companion with voice acting in it. It's just a very good atmospheric story. Slight problem. It's also one of the most house-ruled games I've ever played. Yeah, if you play this game solo particularly, as the game is written, you're going to have a very grindy experience, a very punishing experience, like too punishing, like everybody at Awakened Realms is a sadist type level of punishing. It's like, what on earth? Just give us a head, you son of a I've had to play this with quite a few house rules implemented, whether it's because of those men here that you have to keep up, 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 keep all the time, or just certain rules in the game where it's like, okay, seriously, that is way too punishing, we're just going to trim that down a bit, or just beefing up your ability to actually stay alive in solo mode, because if you don't get really good at combat, you're going to die, period. It's, like, it's a little bit too heavy on the combat front compared to diplomacy. Now, I'm soon to get the prototype for Kings of Ruin, which is their second go at this, and I'm hoping that that fixes a few of the problems that I have in this version to make it a much more streamliner, sort of like a much more, you know, a better system. But that's not to say I dislike this Tainted Growl. I've got Age of Legends, the third campaign on my table at the moment. I'm halfway through it, and again, I'm enjoying the story and the setting. But again, I've had to house rule a lot of occasions where I just think, come on, that is stupid, that is too punishing, or it's good, like, this is forcing me to take, like, an hour to grind this or something. It's like, no, no, let's just skip ahead a little bit or find some other way to do it. So it's kind of weird that it's high up on the top 100 despite having to kind of half redesign the game for them. But that story, the setting, the atmosphere is so good that it 
does deserve that place up here and I have to kind of just say that that is the caveat with this. If you're not the sort of person who likes to house rule things, you might struggle with this. You know, if you're not going to play this with at least two people, maybe even three, to get a decent fledged out party, again you might not like this. But for solo gamers, you gotta house rule it because it will be a bit of a dodgy experience if you don't. So, uh, big asterisk on this one, but it's still very strong for me, Tainted Grail. Right, my 57 is down only six places from 51. It's always been hanging around in this section of 10, I feel. And this is the number one board game on Board Game Geek. Well, at least it should be. Yes, I've had some flack for this, but uh, I'm still staying by it, okay? You might have thought, wait a minute, number one board game? Luke likes Gloomhaven? Well, no, I don't. It's not Gloomhaven. A, a giant 150 pound box with content you'll never see that's got bland aesthetics and all that. That's your number one board game of all time? No, 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 no. I'll give you a piece of <laughs> No, 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 no. Ticket to Ride, on the other hand, should be the number one on Board Game Geek. I haven't even watched the Dice Tower top 10 list they did. Um, was it top 10 games Camilla's played? I can't remember. But, you know, they're, they're going through and they're saying what 10 games should be in the Board Game Geek top one, top 10. Maybe I should do that list at some point because I got my own theories about what games should be in there and Ticket to Ride is one of them. I'm sorry, this big giant crate for niche gamers or the evergreen of all time since 2004 that has got more people into the hobby than I think any other modern board game that my parents love, my dad adores and yet I got all the expansions for and I still enjoy it whether it's the big version and expansion or even those tiny little 20 minute filler ones that are brilliant teaching tools. Ticket to Ride is still a really fun game, even the app is fantastic as well. I still enjoy this light game, it's stupidly light, you're, putting, you're playing cards rummy style to put train tracks on the board and go from A to B. Yeah, it's trains, but honestly you could replace it with any type of transport. I mean, hell, to be honest, the small ones do. You get taxis and trams and stuff like that, but forget the theme, it's just a super simple, very smooth game that, honestly, it's so dark simple you wonder how you didn't think of it yourself in terms of design, but it's gone on since 2000. Four. It's still going strong. People are still playing it. It's in. If any dice, sorry, not dice. If any board game cafe does not have multiple ticket to rides in their collection in their library for the public to play, then they need to seriously reconsider whether they can be considered a good game cafe. Yeah, I'm going that strong. Damn! It's one of the most evergreen games there is and that's why I think it should be the number one on board game geek because it has done so much for the hobby and yet gamers and non-gamers can still play it and enjoy it. Forget Gloomhaven, Ticket to Ride it is and I'll bet you that's gonna get a response and a half. Where's that Hellraiser mean? We have such sights to show you. My 56 is the result of a drop of 23 places, quite a big drop, and it's not that I dislike the game, but there is, I do like the look at trains of my game tastes and how they affect and how they've altered since doing like top 100 lists. And one trend I am noticing in recent years is that when it comes to big, heavy Euros, the more complex, the more fiddly, the more effort that's required in setting it up and getting it to the table and getting it played, the less I'm inclined to want to play it. It, you know, that, there are times when a game can have too much, too much bloat, and this is one that is suffering from that a little bit, but I still really enjoy Anachrony. This is my favorite of all the Mind Clash games. So yes, yeah, spoiler alert, Perseverance is not on the list. You wanna know why, the 10 reasons or so, go check out my extended review of that. That will explain everything. But Anachrony is still a great fun Euro game. The idea that you're preparing for this meteor that's gonna land, and you're essentially sending out your workers as well as like big mech suits in order to get the resources you need to fulfill your evacuation condition, build projects, get buildings, and do all sorts. It's super complicated, it's super like heavy, but it's a cool fun game. 
very thematic, really cool aesthetics, especially with the mechs. I love the fact that it's basically devolved loans to time travel because the idea that you have to, uh, every time I think about it, it blows my mind. This idea of, hmm, I need this resource now this turn. Hang on, let me just borrow it from myself in the future. And now I've got it for use now. And then we get to said future and it's like, oh yeah, I better pay that thing back because otherwise I cause paradoxes. Uh, wibbly wobbly, timey wimey. It's just such a cool concept that, you know, you can't help but marvel at it. But there is such a thing as too much bloat. I don't like any of the micro expansions that this game has had. I mean, the future imperfect, I could not care less. You know, the Doomsday Clock, I don't play it. The Pioneers, I don't play it. The only expansion I want to shove in this game is the Fractures of Time, the big expansion where you can basically glitch everywhere. Cool thematic integration, but again, that's a lot of rules. I mean, even for me and others, you know, me and a few others who are like people who can get into this game and enjoy it and we've played it enough times, it's still a lot of rules. It's a lot of complexity and it's like, uh, do I want to go through that effort to get it all there and I've got to relearn it every time because it's not a game you can easily remember the rules to. Even the base set anachrony requires you to do a bit of a rules research, but cool, oh, blimey, you're throwing fractures, your brain is going to melt by the end of the day. But it is such a good expansion that I do like to play it from time to time. But it's one of those occasions where it's just too much bloat. I mean, the base game and fractures would have been plenty, but we did not need all these silly little micro expansions to go with it. It's just not worth it. Hence, it has dropped a fair few places. Will it continue dropping? That remains to be seen, because every time I play it, I do really enjoy it. It is like one of those, is it worth the effort, is the question. So far, yes, if I keep it to base set only and possibly fractures. If I was to add other stuff in, it wouldn't be worth the effort. The infinity box makes setup a bit easier, which is certainly a plus, but yeah, I think with Euros in general, I just want them to be a bit easier to get to the table and remember the rules to them. We're gonna see some good examples of those later on on the, you know, in the top 50 area, but yeah, you know, Anachrony can't really stay in the top 50. It has to come down a bit, but still really enjoy it. Great Euro game. Definitely worth looking into if you're into the super heavy stuff. Dropping 14 places to my 55 is my choice of farming game that there is. Loads of people lord over Agricola, like, oh, Agricola. And it's like, look, I give Agricola respect. It's got a great theme. It's farming. It's pretty cool. I hate the fact that you have to get a full family, otherwise you lose. I hate the fact that you have to do every little bit of farming, otherwise you lose a ton of victory points, which means that differentiation be damned, you know. It's like, there's things I like in Agricola, like the occupations, but there's stuff I don't like. So honestly, as much as people are gonna hate me for it, Caverna kills Agricola. Caverna is my 55, and that one is just a great sandbox farming game. I love the farming theme. You know, farming themes in games I think are fun. And it's not because I'm from Somerset in the West Country and that we're all farmers. I drove my tractor through your haystack last night. I've never actually worked on a farm, people, but I just love in the Caverna, I can decide, well, what do I fancy doing? You know what? I'm just gonna harvest a ton of corn and be the corn master and just make booze. You know what? I'm gonna just have a load of mines and a bunch of little donkeys making donkey juice. I don't know, it's like God, that Z Garzeris thing is going to rub off on me. But you know, there's a lot of things that I can decide I want to do and the game doesn't hinder me for it. Do I want to just have nothing but pigs? Yes, and you will get a point for every pig. You know, will you suffer in other areas? Yes, but you will get point for every pig, point for every sheep, point for every vegetable. There's no cap. There's no like, restriction saying, no, how dare you do that? It's So you may think, well, hang on, what difference does it make what you do? No, you still gotta be efficient with your actions. You still need to get some worker, extra workers and stuff, but the fact that I have the freedom to try different paths to victory is such a good thing. And I love the new races that you get in the Forgotten Folks expansion. You can even teach the game with some of them because it actually gears that person onto a particular route so they're not too overwhelmed with what's out there. Am I really looking forward to, was it uh, Fanatical Fiends or whatever it's called, the newer, ex the new expansion? Uh, yes and no, I mean, again, like with Anachrony, you can have a too much of a good thing, but I'm keen to see what the expansion will add. It's been delayed for ages, so God knows whether anybody even remembers it's coming anymore. But yeah, Caverna's still going strong. Cap it at four players. Don't play with five or six or seven, because that's just madness. In fact, I've chucked away the board, so I can't actually do that. But Caverna, still my choice of farming games if you're gonna compare Agricola and Caverna, that is. 
Okay, I think this is the biggest drop on the list and a lot of that comes from the last campaign I played, yeah. Another trend I'm seeing is that I'm getting sick and tired of campaign games like being everywhere. Like everything's got to be a giant campaign. What is wrong with scenarios? This has dropped 33 places. It used to be my 21. Now it's in my 50s and it's probably going to continue dropping at this rate. This is The Lord of the Rings, The Journeys of Middle Earth. This is a fantasy flight game played in a campaign with app integration. And I like the app integration in this. You know, it crashes every now and again, but you know, app integration is generally pretty good. It's got great Lord of the Rings uh, theming. I wish there was more actual Lord of the Rings music on the app. It's very repetitive. But you essentially go through a campaign, meet different characters, you know, you play as some iconic heroes or some other people from the lore. You fight monsters, you go speak to people, interact with like NPCs. But essentially they're like 13 act campaigns in a sense. And they're a mixture of battle maps, which are basically these two tiles that you put together with a... Uh, sort of terrain pieces everywhere, which look a little weird, I gotta admit, but you know, they're still pretty cool for an easy setup. But then you've also got the journey maps where you go across different tiles and you reveal them and you expand and explore. Granted, when you've got a lot of expansions like I have, trying to find the wretched tiles is a chore. I wish there was an easier way of doing it, but you know, well, that's just something that happens with, again, too much bloat. Why is this drop so much? Well, I do really enjoy the game. I love the card system in it. The idea that your deck of cards is not only the abilities that you can have, but also your successes and your misses for your skill tests. I find it really cool. I can buy this card. It's a really awesome card, but it doesn't have any success icons on it. So it's technically a wasted card for skill tests, even though I like the ability. And the characters function very differently. Some are combat munchkins, some are great at exploring, some like you know can heal others. It's just a lot of cool connected parts. What's made this drop though is two things. One, campaign, campaign, campaign. There's no individual scenarios in this, which means if you get it out, you gotta go through a lot of games in order to get it done. And also, the last campaign I did was a little lackluster. Stupid fat hobbit. Spreading War, it was the Rohan one. It started off alright, but then it started to get very repetitive and a bit boring and I wasn't a big fan of the campaign in general. But what also is a problem with this game is the difficulty curve. The difficulty curve is ridiculous. If you play this on hard mode, you are a complete masochist. But if you play on normal mode, it will be fairly tough, but there will be times where it will just be stupidly hard. Like, you know, it will be... Da, 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 <clears throat> Like, it completely punches you in the face without warning. So I thought, let's try this on adventurer mode. And then it's pretty easy, but you get to enjoy the story. But then even when I got to the finale, you know, one or two missions, the finale and the penultimate uh, mission, the difficulty curve just went like that. It Well, not even like that. It was vertical. Absolute vertical. The finale, I kid you not, I think the finale in the Spreading War campaign is impossible. Like, actually impossible to complete. It wants you to fight way too many creatures with only two heroes at your disposal if you're playing it solo. It just does not work. And it's getting frustrating going through a whole campaign just to get punched in the face when you get to the finale. And that's why it's already started dropping. If more content comes out for it, unless it's smaller campaigns, I might not be that keen to get it back to the table again, knowing that it's going to be like that. But I have enjoyed my time with it, you know, to date. It's just it's no longer a top 20 wordy game, or top 25 even. So it's dropped now, I think that if it's gonna carry on just sitting on my shelf for a bit, it could drop and eventually fall out of the top 100, you know, that could happen. These campaign games have this issue where you play them for a while and you really enjoy them, and I do think it's a really enjoyable game, I really do like it, but yeah, eventually you run out of content, or you start getting annoyed with the time constraints and that, and yeah, it can affect its rating over time. That's just the nature of the beast. Anyway, still enjoy this game, but yeah, it's on the way down. Throw yourself in next time and rid us of your stupidity. So we've had a big drop. Let's be more positive and actually go all the way up. 39 places for this one. I think it is, yeah. 30, yep, 39 places for my 53. This one is... It's just climbing and climbing and climbing. Now, I don't think it's going to get much higher than this, but I've really enjoyed this title from Osprey Games. I, I think, it, you know, I played it a little bit last time I did the top 100, and I thought, this has the potential to grow. Recent times when I've taken it to Dice Portsmouth events at, like, Comic Cons and that, 
even though I have something like, you know, well, I don't want to spoil the titles, but let's say I've got some prettier gateway games out, people still ask me, oh, what's this one? Let's play it. Even though it looks like a dog's dinner, it's Cryptid. Cryptid is a really fun deduction game, but it's basically a bunch of little colored blocks on a very bland looking map. It's not exactly a looker, to say the least. Well, no offense, but if that is a woman, it does look like she was beaten with an ugly stick. But people see it and they instantly want to play it. It's kind of weird. It has a hidden appeal. But that's not a problem because I really enjoy this game. The idea that there is one monster on this six tile board and mathematically it can only be in one spot. So each of you has a clue from booklet and based on you know what answers people give when you ask the group or individual questions like can it be here or is it in this area, you eventually work out what clues the others must have read and then you're able to juice based on those clues exactly which hex on the tiles it can be and it can only be in one space. Biggest flaw with the game is that it's not even a flaw of the game frankly it's a flaw of the genre. If somebody gives out the wrong information it will break the game and I still cannot fathom to this day how people are able to claim that they have you know high-tech engineering jobs and are computer programming geniuses and teachers and all that and yet for some reason the ability to understand a clue that says within two spaces of this or on desert or swamp is apparently too complex for them. Dear God, what is it like in your funny little brains? It must be so boring. <sighs> does slightly get on my nerves when somebody breaks the game for that but you know I do my best to teach them and tell them you know make certain you understand the clue but somehow it still happens but that aside that rant out of the way I do really enjoy this game it's quick simple I mean you can get this game done in 30 minutes it's practically a filler maybe a little bit longer with more players or certainly if you try the advanced mode which melts your brain I rarely do advanced modes it certainly gets the brain cells ticking but in a really good way honestly I still really enjoy it and apparently it's just got a massive appeal that I'm not aware of but hey it's nice when ugly games can still get people wanting to play them it doesn't have to be pretty although it would be nice if it was a little bit prettier evil does not wear a bonnet My number 52 has only dropped seven places, it's relatively stable, it's just fallen out of the top 50. This is one of my favourite solo only games, it's very simple, I have the new Stronghold version even though I kind of regret getting rid of the Sashi and Sashi version, it's like, yeah this is something about the cutesy artwork on that, but I like drinking coffee. I especially like this solo game, Coffee Roaster, where I get to brew my own cup of coffee. It's a bag builder, you choose which coffee you're going to make and it's got a star rating that you're trying to achieve. So you put all the tokens as per the scenario into the bag and then you draw so many out each turn as the Coffee Roaster does its thing, adding smoke over time if you let it roast for too long. And the idea is, is that you use these various abilities and different tokens in order to basically jury rig your bag until you say, I'm ready to pour my cup. And then you draw 10 tokens, you put them in your cup and see how close you can get with some other jiggery pokery tricks that you can pull off with you know stuff you've managed to unlock. It's just a very simple zen like solo bag builder. It's a clever game, it's a wonderful nice little theme. I can't play it without having a nice cup of coffee like nearby to sort of go hmm yeah, let's see. Hmm, nice, nice. It's very relaxing and very nice. Yeah, there's going to be some luck involved. You are drawing stuff out of the bag. But yeah, you can get a game of this done in five to ten minutes. Yeah, you could play through a set of three in their like special like challenge mode in like 20 minutes. It's a very quick game. You know, granted, I think maybe I should have hung on to the Sashi and Sashi version from a production standpoint, but the new version is still pretty cool. If you're a fan of light solo games, you really need to check out Coffee Roaster. Right, Luke, where's this new game you were talking about? Well, here it is. This is the new game on the list and uh, you're going to be very surprised by this because I didn't think it would get this high but when I was doing the comparisons it's like, yeah, it has to. And I've got to give a little caveat with this one, okay? Not, not like, oh, there's a reason why it shouldn't be this high but it is but... Tom Vassell said something in one of his recent like top 100 bits a while back where he had to accept that if it's a game that you get played a lot, that you teach a lot, that you still enjoy playing, even if it's a really light little game, it deserves to be high on your top 100 because it's clearly a game you really enjoy. Are there certain games lower in the list that I might objectively like enjoy more on a single play? 
Possibly yes. Probably yes. But the fact that I can get this game to the table so often, so fast, it's dirt cheap, really good production quality, and yet it's still a fun game, I gotta give props to Alice's Garden. What? I gave it a 9 out of 10 when I reviewed it, and I do think, you know, it deserves to be at this number 51 spot on my top 100, because it's a 30 minute filler tops, and you know, possibly even less time than that, that I can pull out all the time, teach to just about anybody, it's an introductory level polyomino game, and it's well produced. I mean, for less than £20, you get those green embroidered bags, all the different tiles, nice colourful artwork, and you're basically just filling up your small board with different scoring conditions for the various symbols, which don't change in, in different games, but it keeps it nice and simple. You choose which like, shape you're gonna do, and then everybody has to draft from a row of those tiles. So you're looking at other people's boards, sort of going, well, you don't like that shape, you don't like that shape, I could probably slot one in there if I can get the symbols right. You know what, we're gonna have this shape this round. And everybody gets to do that, and you just carry on until somebody can't make a move, which can sneak up on you when you least expect it. It just gets played a lot because I can fit it in a small length of time and teach it to anybody. It's a gateway level game. And yeah, I gotta give credit to something like that. You know, I'm not, I mean, games like No Thanks, for example, very simple, gateway level. You can teach it to just about anybody and get it done in 10 minutes. But when was the last time I ever felt like playing No Thanks? It's not exactly a game I enjoy that much. But Alice's Garden, I feel like I wanna bring it out. It's something that I wanna get off the shelf. And I think that, makes it deservingly be on this list. I think he's pretty. Quiet, bud. I think it's gonna freak out a lot of people to have heard that this was my new game for this section of the 10, but yeah, credit where it's due. Alice's Garden is just that good a filler. So there you go, we are done with the bottom 50 games of my top 100. We are really getting into the creme de la creme now. The 9s and 10s are going to start flooding in soon. There are two new games on the next batch of 10. There's definitely some movers, yes. Oh, we are really getting into some great stuff. Not that the bottom 50 has not been great either. I really do enjoy these games, people, even when I've had negatives to say about them. No game is perfect. Even in my top five games, no game is perfect. There are still criticisms to make, but it's just how much enjoyment I've had for the game, you know, how much I still get. And, you know, there are certainly trends you will notice in my gaming taste and what sort of games I want to spend the effort on. I already mentioned about the whole super heavy Euro with a ton of bits. Is it worth the effort? I've mentioned about campaign games. Can we have something a bit quicker and easier than a full campaign? These things are stuff I'm noticing as time has gone on. And as I say, it's going to affect the ratings. But, uh, yep, yeah, hope you're still enjoying the list. And, uh, you know, can't wait to get started on the next section of 10. But in between this and my recent Snowdonia holiday that I've booked, I'll try and get it done when I can. But, uh... Some of us still need a break. <laughs> you know, sometimes I just need to clear my mind. So uh, that's it for me. I'll see you on the next Broken Meeple video. Remember, if you like what you see, thumb up the video, consider subscribing to the channel, the Patreon, but most of all, talk about the games in the comments. Let me know what you think of these 10 games, higher or lower, what you think of the trends that I mentioned. You know, get talking, get discussing. You've been fantastic in all the previous top 10s, getting those views in, getting those comments and the likes. It's been great to read what you have to say. So that's it for me. You you know, if you want to check out more content on the channel, I've got Beyond the Base Game videos and of course the previous sections of the Top 100 if you haven't seen them, but also my two-player game reviews that I'm doing at the moment. You know, pick and choose. I'll pick two when I do this video in the editing room. So take care and remember as always, whether it's the bottom 50 or the top 50, there's still only games. Bye for now. Love you all.